Is it possible to put this metal ball inside this little cup? Well, unless we invoke black magic, most rational people would say that it's difficult at best. We cannot imagine putting an elephant inside an ant's stomach in one go. Now, is it possible to put a, an entity that extends indefinitely into a finite box? Well, that's exactly what the folks at General Relativity propose to do when they talk about black holes and Big Bang. A black hole is a star that has compressed itself to a mathematical singularity. According to the religion of mathematics, a black hole has no extension, no structure, no length, width, or height. Incongruously, this leads the mathematicians to reach the opposite conclusion, that a black hole is spatially infinite. One relativist illustrates this ridiculous surrealistic contraption. A black hole can be pictured as a situation in which the dip continues stretching downward to infinity. The problem is that Big Bang is not. Big Bang can be spatially finite or infinite. When Big Bang is spatially finite, we end up with a spatially infinite black hole perforating our spatially finite universe. We indeed end up with an ant trying to squeeze an elephant inside its stomach. That's just one of the contradictions between the mathematical requirements of Big Bang and black hole equations. Here are some of the others. A black hole is eternal. Big Bang is not. What do the mathematicians mean by that? Big Bang is said to have started up some 13 or 14 billion years ago according to the creationists of relativity. So it had a beginning. Well, didn't the black hole start when the star collapsed to a dimensionless point? So the best way to understand what the mathematicians mean by eternal is to put it in Bill Gates' terms. A black hole is a photograph. Big Bang is a movie. A black hole is mathematically described as a standalone object. Big Bang is described as a process. The Schwarzschild solution for a black hole is an example of a static space-time. The Schwarzschild metric describes the space of a spherical, uncharged, non-rotating body. All we have is a singularity covering its shame with an event horizon at a certain radius r from the center of the sphere. Time plays no role whatsoever. In this sense, a black hole, like Leonardo's Mona Lisa, is eternal. There is no motion inside the picture. For sanity's sake, we at least hope not. Time is not a factor in its description. Conversely, Big Bang is a work in progress. Big Bang cannot do without time. Big Bang is expanding. A black hole is not. Indeed, you can't expand that which doesn't have shape. But this debunks the notion that we live inside a black hole. The equations forbid it. A black hole consists of one mass. Big Bang consists of countless stars and galaxies. The mathematicians postulate Big Bang to be a fluid made of a single piece. Certainly, the primordial singularity cannot be conceived to be made of parts. So how did the atoms and galaxies come out of an entity made of one piece? If you have nothing else to do and want to amuse yourself, you may want to read how the mathematicians go out of their way to answer this profound question. Finally, Big Bang is not asymptotically flat at the boundary conditions whereas a black hole is. 
A black hole weighs down the canvas of space-time, and at its boundaries, the space-time around it approaches the asymptote. But what if you put two black holes inside the universe? Well, clearly, the space-time at the boundaries of one black hole will curve into that of the other. It is important to keep in mind that these are requirements and conditions of the equations. These are mathematical specifications. Let's let Mr. Stephen Crothers explain it to us in his kangaroo accent from down under. The theory that uh, 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 Einstein and his followers have come up with one way or another, um, and it really doesn't hold any water. So let's have a look at what the argument's all about. The Big Bang cosmology, the Big Bang universe. It starts off with nothing. There's no mass, no radiation, no physical laws, no space time, just absolutely nothing. Then it comes into existence with a bang. Uh, and it expands this way, say, it's getting larger. Now, these models of the Big Bang are what are called spherically symmetric universes. Uh, and so they sometimes talk about the radius of the universe. Now, to, to model this, what happens is the model begins with a perfect fluid model. This is a one mass model. Because there are no known solutions to Einstein's field equations for more than one mass, and there's no existence there for more than one mass. What do you mean by no existence theorem? Ah, well, there is no way that we can say uh, by a mathematical expression uh, or mathematical proof that Einstein's field equations contain latent solutions for more, two or more masses. Consequently, any model proposed uh, must only contain one mass. And the reason uh, why the Big Bang uh, uh, is modeled in this way is for that very uh, uh, fact. So the Big Bang universe is modeled as a perfect fluid. This means that the whole universe is conceived of as being completely filled by a continuous, homogeneous, indivisible distribution of matter uh, in the form of a perfect fluid of uniform pressure and density. So this universe comes into being from absolutely nothing. There's no time, no space time, no nothing. Uh, and then all this matter comes into existence as a perfect fluid and expands. But then at some stage we're told that all of a sudden this indivisible fluid actually starts to form clumps. These are the galaxies and stars ultimately and there's radiation permeating still here. But this how, can, how can a fluid be indivisible. Well, uh, it's, it's thought of as a continuum, something that is a perfect fluid. This is an abstract idea, a perfect fluid. Are we saying it's made out of a single piece? Yes. So the whole universe is made out of a single piece. You can't divide it up into little bits and say, oh, this is a little bit of fluid and here's another little bit of the fluid, because as soon as you do that, now you're taking sections that you've isolated as one, as, to, as for example, two separate masses. You can do this and say three or four or five or many more. The only problem is there are no solutions for two or more masses in Einstein's theory and, uh, and there are no, it is no existence in them. So the modelers are compelled to treat the universe as a single mass. So this idea uh, involves what we call superposition. I don't want to explain too much about superposition at this stage except to say that you cannot just stick in extra masses at your whim uh, because you decide that you want to have galaxies and stars. That doesn't work in general relativity. But this is precisely what is done to get all the galaxies and the multiple black holes and the stars from this perfect fluid model. Now, let's have a look a little bit further at uh, what this Big Bang model involves. We are not told, generally speaking, uh, in any uh, of these reports or papers and documentation and popular articles on Big Bang as to what we're actually speaking about uh, other than, uh, rather than in terms of uh, what possible models there are. There are actually three possible Big Bang models. 
One is a finite universe. Again, they're all spherically symmetric. And that's why they talk about radius of the universe. Now, the finite one involves what is called a positive curvature space-time. There are two others, two of both of which are spatially infinite. This one's spatially finite, this one's spatially infinite, and it's flat. It has a zero curvature. The third alternative is an, another uh, spatially infinite universe, but of negative curvature. So we have three, positive, zero, or negative curvature. When they talk about the Big Bang, Generally, you don't know which one of these three options that they are talking about. They don't tell us which model specifically they want to employ uh, in this regard. Uh, you will sometimes find reference to the saying that space is very nearly flat. Nearly flat. Well, is it therefore slightly positive curve or is it slightly negative curve? This is important because if it's nearly flat but it's slightly positive curve, it's got to be finite spatially, and if it's slightly negative curved, then it will be an infinite again, but it will have a negative curvature, or if it's nearly flat, we've still got an infinite, spatially speaking. So, there are three models here, generally, well, I, I would say, invariably, we are not told which particular model uh, is utilised, only that everything is designed in terms of a model of a perfect fluid that fills any one of these particular uh, options, and then they generate lots and lots of stars and black holes and galaxies. How? By just saying so. Oh, there we get clumps here and clumps there, violating the fact that we're starting off with a one mass model of a perfect fluid. This concludes part one of Mr. Crowther's presentation. To synthesize his arguments, Big Bang starts out as a single uniform fluid mass that magically lumps into points, parts, and pieces. Then, the mathematicians seldom tell you which universe they are referring to when they mention the term Big Bang. Are they talking about the finite or the infinite universe? This is what you have to ask when you listen to their dissertations. In part two, Mr. Crothers will explain in more detail some of the contradictions illustrated at the beginning of this video.